thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Are there any ladies here? Yes. What a shame. We need more motor engineers, and I hope that uh, this presentation will entice some people that aren't motor engineers to explore that. So uh, this is kind of an unusual topic. Uh, there's a research center at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, that's devoted to electric machines. And, uh, and they, they have sort of a consortium there, which is made up of only American companies. And these companies provide money funding for them to go along with the federal funding. And what they do is they buy foreign built and designed electric cars, hybrid or electric cars. And they, they'll buy one of these at a junkyard or a dealer and they take them apart, reverse engineer them and uh, release a report that's available to the consortium members for a year. And after a year, they make those available to anyone in the world. And the idea is to uh, help Americans learn what foreign competition is doing to help create jobs in America, blah, blah, blah. So I've worked with them since 2004 on the very first Toyota Prius that was sold in this country. The first Prius was 2003, but it was only sold in, in Japan, and the 2004 was sold here. So, uh, so what they've done most recently, they've tested most all the electric cars and hybrid cars over the years. But the most recent project that they finished last year was the BMW i3. And this is a very interesting car because, uh, first of all, the body is carbon fiber. And the carbon fiber is all made in the United States in Oregon in a huge factory there. It was the best carbon fiber facility in the world. It was uh, put there for, for Boeing, for airplanes, that sort of thing. And BMW bought them out, invested a couple billion dollars and increased their capacity, and that's what they make the bodies for these cars out of. And so they designed their own electric motor. So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to show you about that motor because it's very interesting. It's one of the highest torque density motors uh, of any car in the world. So that's why it's of interest. It's a hybrid uh, motor. It's partially synchronous reluctance, and it's partially permanent magnet AC synchronous. So we'll look at those. And, uh, and then they've added a, a range enhancer. Let's see how this thing works. Well, uh, <clears throat> they, they've added a range enhancer, which is a little a moped motor with a generator on it. We're going we're gonna, to uh, talk about that as well. So, so, uh, uh, so the material that's included in this presentation is uh, some, some stuff that stuff, I'll call it, published by BMW themselves including their, their press releases and their specifications of what the car and the motor is supposed to do. And then uh, Oak Ridge Labs teardown study and a company called Monroe Associates uh, bought a car, took it apart, and they published some documentation. So I've taken some slides from their stuff. And then uh, Infolitica Corporation makes, uh, uh, sells software. They recently sold out to Siemens. They make software for, for uh, simulating electric machines. A lot of motors around the world designed with this. So I use that in my consulting. And uh, so I've uh, used, used uh, MotorSolve to simulate this machine. And, and then we're going to compare some of the results with, uh, with uh, the data that, that Oak Ridge tested and those sort of things. So that's what this is about. So that's what the car looks like. It's a little avant-garde for me, but it's still kind of cute. And uh, that's all carbon fiber, as I say. You know, here's some more pictures of the inside. You see it's got, a, it's got a platform frame underneath with a battery pack in the floor for low center of gravity, naturally, like everybody does. And the, the frame parts are all aluminum. So there's really not much steel in this car. Even the wheels are aluminum. And at the back there, uh, at the, in this, uh, could, could, I don't know if you can see the mouse. I don't think you can see the mouse. Is there a pointer? on this thing? I don't know. Anyway, you could see up a right-hand corner there, you see the rear wheels. It's obvious the, the electric motor and the, and the range, range extender are in there. There's a pointer on there somewhere. I tried that. OK, I'll, I'll get by. Don't worry. So uh, this, this is the uh, publication by uh, uh, BMW themselves. And this tells you what the battery capacity is, the horsepower of the motor, 
170 horsepower at 4,000 RPM with the torque is it, and, uh, and the single charge range. Now this 81 miles was the original that came out. It's, uh, I think it's close to 200 miles now. They've changed the, the battery technology and the charging time and the equivalent uh, highway mileage uh, where it's made, that sort of thing. And in the lower left-hand corner there, you see the, uh, the torque speed curve, which is in the, uh, the power curve. And this is typical of traction machines. You need a lot of torque at stall, at start up for accelerating, and then uh, you wanna be able to go high enough speed for, for highway travel, so you don't need a shifting transmission like internal combustion engines use. Now, hybrid and fuel cell buses, they'll use transmissions but uh, most cars don't. Uh, as I said before, this motor is available, this car is available in two versions. One's pure electric, where the traction motor is, of course, a generator during braking to improve the mileage and take some of that stored kinetic energy in the car during stopping and put that back onto the bus, the, the DC bus. The electric uh, version with a range ex extender has a separate motor scooter motor in there, which I'll show you a picture of. It's, it's used, I think it's, I don't know where it's made, Italy someplace or China, Japan, I don't know where it's made, but it's used in some of the BMW uh, motor scooters or motorbikes or motorcycles, whatever you want to call them. So what they did is they put a, uh, a uh, permanent magnet synchronous generator on there, and as, as far as I know, that is made by Valio in, uh, in France, and that, that generator was designed by Valio and built by Valio, supplied by Valio, whereas the the main traction motor was designed and built by BMW themselves. So Tim Burris at Oak Ridge Labs, uh, has, has, we've collaborated together for many years, and so we put this uh, whole program together. And uh, uh, the car that they t bought and tested was a 2016 model, and the whole uh, motor, and generator, motor generator was disassembled. That car did not have a range extender in it, so uh, uh, all it, it was a pure electric one, so I had to get my information on the range extender elsewhere. Uh, so the published poll number is 12. Now, this motor goes, top speed is 11,400 RPM, which is about 1,500 hertz fundamental commutation frequency, which is awful high for a, a, a traction motor. 12, the Toyota Prius, well, now let me start off. The, the Tesla is a four-pole induction motor. <clears throat> the Prius is an eight-pole permanent magnet AC synchronous motor. The Chevy Volt is a 10-pole permanent magnet AC synchronous motor. The BMW is a 12-pole permanent magnet synchronous AC mo uh, synchronous motor. So, so you see the, uh, now every time you double the number of poles, as most of you motor designers know, the back iron, that's the steel over the slots or the steel inside the magnets. Every, if I double the number of poles, the thickness of that back iron is cut in half. Now, if you pick any given motor, that going from four pole to eight pole can cut the weight and the mass of that motor by 25, 30% because you get rid of that band of solid steel on the outside. So by the time you get up to uh, 12 poles, you know, you've got a, uh, a very high torque density motor. Now let's talk about density of machines. You hear all the time about power density. Who cares, who gives a rat's patootie about power density? Let's, let me use an example. Let's say I take an induction motor that's uh, driven off the grid at 60 hertz. If I put an inverter on it and double the speed, I do that by doubling the frequency to 120 hertz, I've doubled the power density of that machine. I've doubled the output power. All I did was double the speed, all right? A permanent magnet machine or like a DC motor, all I have to do is double the voltage. I double the speed and I've doubled the power density. So power density is not the way to compare one motor to another. Uh, electric machines produce torque by the flux linkage in air. Here, here's the rotor. This left hand represents a rotor, right hand represents a stator, and, and a big force is generated in that air gap. And so that, that force times the radius to the center of the shaft is torque. So torque density is what's important in comparing machines. How does torque density compare from one machine to the other? Siemens has just come out with, a, with a, an aircraft motor with, that has very high torque density, but the end bells are made out of carbon fiber. So 
that makes the machine very light. So that's another way to do it, is to make all the parts light. So uh, what we did to model this motor is uh, Oak Ridge Labs took, took a stator lamb and a rotor lamb, and they scanned them and digitized the, the scan uh, using some software and created DXF files. And, uh, and so we took those DXF files and created a template for the software. Is uh, Adrian in here? No, Adri Adrian, he's in his booth at, at, uh, at Infolitica, but he's the one that uh, converted those for me. So here's, uh, here's a, a, a comparison of power densities. This is a, a graph that was, that's published by Oak Ridge Labs, and we're not going to study all this, but you can get copies of this. You might be interested in these comparisons. These are all of the uh, electric cars, hybrid cars that Oak Ridge has tested, and this gives you the peak power density and, uh, of the, I believe, the motor and the inverter here. So you can compare those, and you'll see that the, uh, the BMW is one of the highest, okay? Uh, then I added this thing at the bottom showing that Siemens aircraft motor that's got those spider type end uh, frames, bearing end frames made out of carbon fiber to make it light. But you can see that's very high. There, there's a big program going on now to develop a 90 passenger single aisle electric propulsion aircraft to fly across the Atlantic. That's a huge program. NASA has uh, over 500 engineers working on this. And don't be cynical. Remember, they took us to the moon. So our engineering engineers are going to do that. We work with them a lot. So uh, that's, that's why Siemens is developing aircraft propulsion motors. OK, now I already talked about uh, power density. But uh, I want to talk about what's the maximum you can get out of an electric machine. And I want to propose to you, I don't know if any of you ever thought about this before, but what limits the torque or the force, the forces you could generate in this air gap? What limits that? Well, you can argue the cooling limits it, but that's, tr and that's true. But, uh, but beyond that, once you get by the cooling issue, you're still limited by the magnetic flux that you can push through, you can get out of a magnet, or you can push through the, the, the steels. And that's, those are the two limiting factors of what torque density you can get out of any machine. Hard metals, like uh, permanent magnets, 1.4 Tesla, that's the max you can get out of the best neodymium. Soft materials, like electrical steels, the max you can get out of that is 2.1, 2.4 Tesla for for hypercoal 50, 2.1 for silicons. So always keep that in mind. However, if you ever go to the University of uh, Florida State University in Tallahassee, there's an electromagnet there that puts out 45 Tesla. Believe it, 45 Tesla. It'll levitate a rabbit. It's so powerful. Remember, that's a long way from 1.4 Tesla or, or, or uh, 1.1 Tesla. So this is what the drivetrain looks like. And uh, this big space here on the right here is where the, uh, where the uh, range enhancer goes, okay? That's what the electric machine looks like. Uh, it's got a liquid cooling jacket. You see the blue thing on the outside, and then, and then you see the stator next. And pay, make a mental note. Notice that stator looks like it's made of uh, bricks. That's very important, clever thing they did. The blue thing is the rotor, then the other piece on the left is the die cast uh, uh, housing, and then the final cover plate encloses a resolver. Now, what's interesting is every electric vehicle made uses in a resolver. They cannot, no one's been able to figure out how to do a traction motor sensorless. Uh, maybe they can do it, but they can't rely on it because you've got to have peak torque at stall when you accelerate. When you hit the pedal, you want instant torque. And uh, startup routines for sensorless require open loop step motion or some scheme like that, so you can't get peak torque. So they all use a resolver. And as far as I know, 90, maybe 100%, except uh, BMW, uses the Tamagawa resolver, except BMW. They don't use the Tamagawa resolver. I don't know if they designed their own, but they don't use that one. They either buy it or make it themselves. Now, what's interesting is you can go to any uh, BMW dealer, and you could buy this motor. There it is for sale, $1,461. And uh, 
but but there's that includes a court charge. Okay, if you if you uh, you know what a court charge is. If 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 you want to replace your motor, you got to turn your old one back in. But so I don't think any of you will have an old one. You'll you want to. But but there's the part number. There's the BMW part number. So you can buy that. And uh, here's what the, the guts look like. Let's look at that. We're going to study this carefully before we model it because some of the manufacturing techniques they use are very clever, probably patented, so be careful, but they're very clever. As you can see, the rotor on the left, and down the lower left, you see the, uh, the rotor lamination sections. Very interesting. And uh, then the whole stator assembly. Now, uh, then the inverter sets on top of the motor. Before we go any further, I want to point out that this, uh, this hybrid reluctance permanent magnet machine is patented. There's the, the patent application for it. And uh, what it consists of is the minimum mass of magnets. That was one of their goals, to try to use reluctance technology to, to get some reluctance torque out of this machine without using a lot of magnet material because the magnets were expensive when they started designing the machine. They're not so bad now, the price come back down, but uh, so, so they've got all these slits in there on each side of the magnets. Item 25, does this thing work now? Oh, it works now. You, you see what item, I, that's, that's a magnet and that's, that's a magnet. So, so these little slits here are uh, to increase the inductance ratio, which for those of you care, uh, reluctance machines put out their, their reluctance torque without magnets is a function of the, uh, the uh, inductance ratio between the direct axis and the quadrature axis. So, so these uh, air slits in there that are non-magnetic increases the inductance ratio, which increases the uh, reluctance torque, so they don't need so much magnet for the permanent magnet torque. That's, that's the short of it. Now. This shows a certain number of slits. The actual design has a different number than this, but I haven't studied the claims carefully, but I assume the claims are broad enough that it covers their, their actual versions. You can well imagine how many iterations of designs of motors they went through, uh, both modeling and building samples before they came up with their final design. Uh, here's some more pictures of the parts, kind of duplicate. I suppose what's, what's interesting about the upper left and the lower right, it shows how the inverter's mounted right on top of the motor. And that's important because uh, uh, th they don't really use lead wires. They use pigtails, let's call them, which, are, which, which is really magnet wire. A bundle, there's multiple strands per turn, so that's a bundle of magnet wire that uh, is fused into one of those terminals. So, you want to keep the leads real short because there's not a good thermal conductivity path for the for the pigtails. But uh, if you if you add lead wires on it, it's way extra labor and and it's six, and it takes up more intern space. Now, here here's a very interesting bunch of slides. These I took right off of YouTube. You can go on YouTube and you can watch this motor being manufactured. And that's where I got a lot of this information is public. You'll see upper left is where they're, they're winding the coils, multiple strands in hand, and, and, uh, and those, those are wound up above, and they're dropped down on fingers, and they're automatically inserted, and so on. And uh, uh, <clears throat> then they, the, uh, there's a bunch of steps. The, the, you see the lower left shows the shed winder dropping the, the group of windings onto uh, the uh, teeth that insert it into the stator. And then uh, the phase termination is done. They coil up the pigtails and later the, in the movie, they don't show you all the automation they've used, but you, you get the idea of how it's done. But, uh, but then let's start with, uh, let's start with, uh, oh, the, the top right or the middle right. Uh, these, these laminations are punched and they're nested together with those, uh, those uh, cleating dies, those dimple dies. So, so you get a core about 25 millimeters long. And, uh, and so those are, are uh, 
uh, cleated together. You know, they come right off the die like that. I guess most of you are familiar with that. And then, uh, then they insert the magnets in. And this uh, middle picture on the right shows the magnets being inserted. Now, I'm not sure when the magnets are magnetized. I'm not positive of that because I haven't been in the factory. I suspect that that magnet is magnetized right in the assembly machine, you know, right, right before it's inserted. I think that each magnet, the little one and the big one, are magnetized before they're inserted. That's what I think. I don't think they magnetize the whole structure afterwards. There's a lot of controversy in the auto industry about that. Like uh, Honda has an uh, in-house rule or law that you cannot assemble pre-magnetized magnets because there's some people who think that causes cancer or some health problems, you see, from the magnetic field. So they don't use magnetized magnets. Other companies use magnetized magnets. And BMW, I don't know. So, so you have, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. You have seven of these, these cores. And if you'll notice, I want you to notice, you see that? Is there a hole there? See, is there a hole there? Then there's a hole here. My point to the hole? Well, you notice the hole's not in the same place in that one as is this one. Why do you suppose that is? That's because that hole, they use smart dies to punch these. So that uh, punch and die is moved for every set. A 25 millimeters worth has a hole in one position. The next 25, they move it a little bit. The next one, they move it a little bit. So when you stack these on rods, that, that hole... Uh, rotor is step skewed. Isn't that something? Now a lot of people skew rotors for PM machines, but and, and step skewing is done by a lot of companies. But this one is all done automatically by a, a series of manufacturing equipment. Very expensive to generate, but so so this is step skewed. And then uh, uh, so this is a as you'll see in the movie, this is a big turntable with different stations on it. So they're stacking the lambs on one station, then they, uh, uh, no, no, they're already stacked off the die. They set them in a station, then it moves to the magnet insertion station, another magnetic insertion station to put the big magnet and the little magnet in. And then they're stacked on the middle photograph. They're on top of each other. And, uh, and then they're uh, clamped together. There's a plate on each side. And uh, you wonder how they hold the magnets in there so they don't move in the clearance. Because if you have a slot and you put a magnet in, there's play in there, it's not tight. And uh, since these go high speed, you can't have those magnets moving or you'd, you'd lose the, uh, the uh, uh, balance, wouldn't you? And uh, uh, Toyota, they uh, injection mold their rotors with plastic. Other people have used Loctite, all kinds of things, but I'm gonna show you what BMW does, it's very clever. We'll see that in a minute. So that's how the rotor is made. Uh, and, and let's talk about stators now. We're all familiar with these two kinds of stators, the concentric wound stator and distributed wound stator. Uh, a lot, and and electric, electric vehicles use both. They really use both. Uh, <clears throat> the to all the Toyota motors except their generators are distributed winding. Their generators are concentrated around a single tube. And uh, there's different ways to make those. Uh, upper right hand corner is the Ford Fusion. Lower is the BMW. Uh, lower left is the Honda Accord. All right, so they'll, they'll stamp those little lamp stacks, put the bobbin around it, and then automatic wind the coils and group them all together and make a complete stator out of that. Uh, this is uh, the newest, most interesting one. And uh, because of this, I would propose to you that electric motors are like women's fashions. When miniskirts came out, every, every uh, clothing manufacturer in the world uh, produced, introduced miniskirts. Well, motors are like that too. The Chevy Volt came out with this type of a motor. The hairpin winding has been used in the electric starter in your car for 100 years. And so some very smart guys at Ramey, uh, said, well, why don't we make a stator that way and use square wire and get very high slot fill so that the ohmic losses in the stators are reduced. So they came up with a way to do this. And uh, so now it's popular. The 2017 Toyota Prius makes theirs the same way. They took a license from uh, 
from uh, Chevy Volt. And, and I'm quoting on another major motor manufacturer to make 210 prototypes, alpha prototypes, for another big motor company, uh, car company in the United States with, a, with this kind of a whining. And, uh, and you know, they, they start with, uh, they start with these, these coils that are called hairpin windings. They look like this. And right outside here is a company that makes the machines to make these, if any of you are interested, right outside the door here. And uh, so the, these, are, these are the latest thing in electric machines, are these kind of windings. As you can see, uh, there's not much airspace in those slots. Here's some uh, pictures of the stator. But what I want you to look at is this, uh, the bricks. See the bricks in the stator? The stator is made up of little arc sections, you know, partially arc sections that are stamped. Uh, they're stamped in the die. Here's a strip of steel, and they're stamped like this in the die. So I don't know, maybe this is too much detail, but there's two kinds of electrical steels. There's oriented and unoriented. And so for electric motors, since they're round, you use unoriented electrical steels, like M19, for example. And, but, but in spite of, of uh, being non-oriented, there's still a slight orientation in the direction of rolling, the rolling direction. See, if you take an ingot of steel and roll it out into a strip, the, the rollers roll it in one direction, so there's a slight orientation in the rolling direction. Now, what does oriented mean? It means that the permeability in this direction is higher than it is in that direction, the orthogonal direction, the direct opposite, the rolling direction. So, and that does make a difference in the performance of some machines, uh, like step motors, for example. So a step motor, when they make a step motor, they'll, they'll rotate half the stack 90 degrees, so half of it's slightly oriented this way and the other half slightly that oriented that way and that improves the accuracy of the step motor, okay? So what BMW has done, they've stamped it like this and they assemble it like bricks. So, so they've kind of radially oriented the stator by using uh, non-oriented steel that still has a slight orientation. Very clever and uh, that's how they build it. To make it strong though, they lay them up like bricks, all done automatically and and right, right there, you see there, there's a, there's a weld there, tiny little weld. It could be a TIG weld, but it's probably a laser weld. They, they'll weld those, they clamp this all together on an arbor, they got it nice and round, you know, they'll weld it. So that's how they make their stack. Yeah, the weld is the length Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it's perpendicular to the magnet. Yeah, 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 perpendicular to the magnet. And, and remember, uh, that helps the teeth more than it does the yolk. But uh, uh, interesting you brought that up. But typically, when you calculate the flux density in a high torque density machine like this, where you want to keep it as small and light as possible, you tend to run the flux density higher in the teeth than you do the yolk. Particularly in a four pole or eight pole machine where the yolk represents a big mass. 12, I'm not sure it makes a lot of difference because there's not all that much mass in the, in the yolk compared to all the teeth. That I'm not sure about, but typically you'll run the flux density higher in the teeth because your losses will be lower that way and you need the teeth, you need winding space. See, so that's why you'll favor, if you make the yolk thinner, you don't gain much winding space by making the slot deeper. You make the teeth thinner, you gain a lot of winding space because it's a whole length. Anyway, all right, so I want to I wanna show you this picture here. You see the lower right hand corner? Do you see that? What is that? A, I don't know. It looks like a jigsaw puzzle. Male and female jigsaw puzzle. That's how they, these sections are nested together. And you could see now the weld. See the weld bead? You see it? Right in the middle there. So uh, there's six sections and uh, uh, not only does this improve the, uh, uh, the orientation, you know, from the, the rolling direction, but it saves wasted steel. When you nest them like this and stamp them, there's not as much wasted steel. If you stamp a round lamination out of a square piece of steel, you've 
the 20% of the corners you throw away. Now you can punch the hole out. A lot of small brushless machines, they can't use the hole. IPMs, internal magnet machines, you use the hole to punch the rotor out, so that's not wasted. But uh, they, they wanted to have a special uh, stator winding and rotor winding, so they certainly didn't want to waste the hole for their uh, rotor, wind, rotor lamb. So anyhow, uh, there you can see another picture of it. Shows how it's staggered by dovetailing. And we just lift it. Do you see these? Uh, see these little things here? Those are the, the nesting dimples that come right off the die. That's what holds the stack together when it comes off the die. Those are like tiny little lures or, or male-female sections that they just nest together for those who aren't familiar with it. You'll see examples of that all over the place here at the land places. And this is, uh, this, this stator weighs 42 kilograms as received, 125 kilowatts, 250 newton meters. It's got two temperature sensors, one in the coil and one in the rotor bearing. Okay, this upper right hand corner is where the resolver goes and where the, uh, the connections are. Uh, liquid cooling, it's a typical liquid cooled machine where where you've got a, a two-piece housing, concentric housing, and a spiral uh, groove to uh, pump the cooling liquid through. That doesn't do anything, for, that doesn't do much for the interns, and a lot of motors are encapsulated with thermal, thermally conductive epoxies or thermoplastics to take the heat out of the, the hot spot in any motor is always the intern because the, the thermal diffusion path has to go through air. Air is an insulator, it's not a conductor of, of heat a la thermal pane windows, right? Two panes of glass with an air in between. Uh, so there's a, uh, a cutaway, two layer magnets, as I said. And what do the two layers do? The, the, the little magnet in the middle helps, it, it, it contributes to the sinusoidal output of the back EMF for uh, uh, produced by just the magnets. That's what that really does. And uh, I guess uh, rule of thumb in my mind for uh, permanent magnet machines is always go to the highest number of poles that the inverter guy can commutate. You need approximately, with today's uh, transistor technology, whatever your fundamental frequency is for commutating, let's call it, you need a, your PWM or chopping frequency needs to be about 20 times that. That's a very good rule of thumb. So. You got a machine with a 1500, uh, uh, you know, 1 1.5 kilohertz fundamental frequency, which is what this is. It's slightly, it's 1400 some. So your chopping frequency is 20 times that. You know, that's pretty high. And not many transistors can handle that. But uh, they use now what's called multi layer inverters. So you'll have more than one transistor bridge for different parts of the sine wave. So a three layer would, uh, here's a sine wave, and this layer, this part and this part, would be driven by one inverter at a frequency, and th the next section would be another uh, bridge, and the third one would be a third bridge. So, so the transistors see the low frequency of each bridge, but the motor and its inductance see the, fre the frequency of the sum of the three. So that's uh, a multi-level drive, they use that a lot, uh, so let, let, let's look at different permanent magnet motor designs. Here's, here's all the, possi the main possibilities of, uh, of uh, permanent magnet motor designs. You can have the megs on the outside. Those are called uh, SPMs, surface magnet machines. And you can have magnets internal, which are called IPMs. The lower left-hand corner is a spoke-type motor. That's very famous now, becoming more and more popular. Uh, back uh, 20 years ago, uh, Fanuc made 40,000, 40, 45,000 servo motors a month using that technology with ceramic magnets as spokes. And uh, then uh, the one in the middle at the bottom, that's the first Toyota design, that's the second Toyota design, 2004. That's where you put the magnets in a V, and I'll show you why later. The other two on the right are, I, are, are motors with the magnets on the outside. And there's a lot of great applications for that. Muffin cooling fans for electronics are all made that way. 
So uh, I told you what an SPM or a, or a surface mounted meat, and these are the IPMs. I already explained that. Here's uh, on the left is an example of the General Motors uh, Volt, Volt motor, two layers of magnets. And uh, you see this, uh, pay particular attention to this distance, this distance here between the magnets, that distance there. We'll talk more about that later. That's the, uh, that's the salient pole. That's, the re that's what produces the reluctance torque. Okay? Now, and, and there's an optimum width to that. It takes a lot of analysis uh, with 3D modeling to, to get that just right for your machine. As if you make it wider, you got less room for magnets, that's why they're put in the V, so you can have, you can get your magnet surface area back. Remember, phi, lines of flux, is flux density of the magnet you buy times the surface area of the magnet. So if I make that wider, I don't want to make the magnet narrower, I want it the same width, so I break it up in two pieces and put it in a V, so I have the same surface area. Uh, this is an interesting evolutionary uh, view of the 2003 Prius. You see, they used one slab of magnet. They didn't, get, they didn't have enough flux in that motor. So uh, 2004, they put it in a V-shape, 2010. And, and each time, they changed the width of the salient pole in between. You see that? And this is a picture of the 2018, the newest uh, Prius. Uh, we don't know exactly what the rotor looks like in this. It hasn't been. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a company here called NCAP, and he has bought one of these machines and taken it apart, so he knows what it looks like, but I don't know what it looks like. But I, I want you to notice the generator. We're going to talk about generators lately, later. And you notice this, uh, this generator is encapsulated. All right? Now... The, they, they started encapsulating the, the, rotor, the stators of the generator in 2004 because it got so hot, because that's right in the transmission, so it's very hot there. And uh, the, the first one had that encapsulation made out of a ceramic compound. And, and it was shaped to, to touch and fit the die casting, so it had direct contact with the die casting of the transmission case to, to, to get the, uh, uh, a good thermal diffusion path through some good thermally conductive materials to get the heat out of the interns of the winding. But uh, 2010, they didn't use that ceramic material anymore. They, they used a uh, thermal plastic that was filled with some kind of a, uh, a thermally conductive material. Let's see, it was aluminum nitride, I believe, is what uh, Oak Ridge Labs found it to be, which is a fine powder, white powder, and that's mixed into the polymer while it's hot, and then you injection mold in that, and there was a space all the way around it, and that was splash cooled with oil. You know, the die casting was, uh, you know, 20 millimeters away, and, uh, and so that was half full of oil, so the spinning of the rotor would splash that oil over the stator and cool, the, cool it. Uh, the, the stator of the motor in the upper right-hand corner, of course, is that here. Here's another view. There's another big difference, 2018. The generator and the motor are side-by-side -side on separate shafts, but on all prior Priuses, they were on the same axis of rotation. This is the, uh, the 2018 rotor. You can see that potting material for the stator. You see that? Amazing, huh? Now, th this shows an example of the, uh, of the Ramey motor, or the GM uh, Chevy Volt motor. And uh, in the lower right-hand corner, you see, uh, you see how the, uh, the, salient, the saliency width was adjusted, and the angle of the magnets were adjusted, and, and Infolitica, under contract with Ramey, did a whole analysis of this to, to uh, you know, solve hundred solutions to optimize what that 
shape should be. So that's the type of thing you have to go through if you're going to design one of these and to get those optimized. And then uh, what's interesting also is the stator. You see, see the four conductors of the square wire in the stator. And uh, uh, this, this stator has, has uh, 60 slots and 90 conductors. Uh, those who are motor designers will go back and try to figure that out. But uh, there's, uh, there's, there's three coils basically per motor, and, and one coil has two turns, and the other two coils each have one turn. So that's where you get the 90 coils, and they do that to transpose them. There, there again, another detail. With a, with a uh, conductors like this, at high frequencies, the current will not flow uniformly through that cross-section. It'll tend to flow on the conductors closest to the air gap, and on the ones in the bottom of the slot, you'll have less current in there. So you don't have the same current density. This was discovered 100 years ago by the people who make aircraft, or uh, power plant generators. And uh, a German by the name of Verbal developed transposed winding. So, so that's uh, GM and Ramey's solution to this, is these, uh, <coughs> they, one of those conductors in the first slot doesn't go to the same space in the second slot. It goes into different spaces in the slot, so all the coils in series are transposed to different positions in the slot so that the inductance is the same for every turn, and thereby eliminating uh, an impedance uh, number at high speed, high frequency. The first time this happened to me was a spindle motor I designed for Ford for machining engine blocks. And the AC impedance was 100 times the DC resistance line to line. And it was because of this proximity effect that causes this current uh, concentration of the parallel strands that are close to the air gap. <coughs> Here's a, a variety of uh, different kinds of of, uh, of these IPMs, I mean, uh, and, and uh, for those who you want to design these kind of machines, you can look at all the ones that exist and design something that doesn't exist, get a patent, and you're covered for a while, I guess. You see some are two-layered, some are even three-layered. I don't show any three-layered one. Uh, in the middle is the, at the bottom is the, the uh, Camry, which is similar to the Prius, but then when they went to the Lexus, they put a third magnet in place because the sinusoidal wave shape of the back EMF in the, in the Camry and the Prius is not very good. It's got a funny looking little wiggly flat top on it. So, so by the time they got to the Lexus, they put that thin little magnet up in the center, kind of like BMW did, and that, that gives you more flux in the center, so that makes it more sinusoidal. Uh, now this is another type of, uh, of uh, magnets. Uh, remember I said that you're limited by 1.4 Tesla for steel and one, uh, one point, or for magnets and 1.4 1. Uh, 1. for magnets and 2.4 for steel. Well, this is a way to get more flux than one Tesla in the air gap. With all those materials, nobody gets more than one Tesla in the air gap. You can't do that with an induction or brushless or step motor or anything. But if you put the magnets in spoke form, I've, I've designed and built a motor for someone that gets 1.7 Tesla in the air gap. And that's by putting the magnets like spokes of a wheel. So you got soft iron in between. So the North Pole's focus of flux, so up here you got 1.7 Tesla. You see? And uh, Vacuum schmelz in Germany, I don't even know if they're here or not, they've been here other years, and they show a, a little, this, this 10 pole motor up right hand corner is their motor, and uh, that's a very high torque density motor that's used for a race car. And there's people in Europe, you'll, you'll, you can see samples of all these laminations out here on the floor, because that's where I got these pictures in Germany at the same show. I took pictures of people's booth. 18 pole PM motor with uh, magnets like spokes. 14 pole, 12 pole, 10 pole, 8 pole. So that's another. Okay, now the optimization procedure of designing these things is you uh, you have to get the magnet flux right, 
and you have to get the saliency or that, that gap between the magnets right. And in the lower right hand corner, I think I have other pictures, here's a better picture of that. The blue plot is the, is the torque as a function of rotor angle from the magnet only, and the red line is the, uh, the reluctance torque that's due to the saliency of those pole pieces between the magnets, and the red line, or the green line is the sum of the two, okay? So uh, you could get that much torque with a, with a surface mount magnet, but it would take a lot more magnet, and, and the back EMF would be so high, you could never get up to highway speed. And remember, you, you want to, uh, th this, there's no transmission, no shifting in gears. So remember the torque speed curve, you need real high start, starting torque, but you need real high speed. So typically the back EMF of these machines from the magnet is roughly half, uh, at half speed, your back EMF will e equal your DC rail voltage. Okay? At, at about half speed. So that means that you're moving the current angle, you're phase advancing, or you're, or you're, they call it field weakening, but you're really saturating the steel on top of the magnet. So you move the pole, you move the pole. I, so uh, you could calculate the alignment torque, that's the permanent magnet torque, and a reluctance torque. And uh, uh, here's an example of where we calculate it using Infolitica software. And uh, you see the saliency width, and, and uh, in this particular case, the, the current vector was moved six degrees. You see that? I. I guess everybody sees that, right? Anybody doesn't see it? Right, get up and point. So, normally, with a surface machine, your current vector would be right here. But you, if you move it over here, you get this uh, reluctance torque. You move it back here, all you get is the permanent magnet torque, no reluctance torque. Okay? And what you're doing is, is by moving this over, you're saturating this steel right here, because the flux from this tries to go over that way, so that saturates this, which reduces the flux linkage in the stator. It's like reducing the back EMF. So that's how you can go faster. Oh, there's the Lexus rotor punching. You see in more detail the D axis and the Q axis of the, the Camry punching versus the Lexus punching. There's the Lexus top, Camry, and the Prius comparison. These, these are nice comparative charts that with all the, the real dimension, the actual dimensions that Oak Ridge Labs provide. All this available on these reports. You can go to Oak Ridge website and you can uh, get reports on all these different machines if you're interested. And uh, th this shows how you, you play around and optimize that. See the magnet angles change in the, and the one millimeter width, four millimeter width, eight millimeter. You, you could set up a finite element software product to do a bunch, a batch file, a bunch of solutions and, and set uh, limits on that and solve for, for this sort of thing. Here's some more uh, information on, this is uh, data that Oak Ridge uh, took, they, they uh, based on this experiment they did, they uh, calculated the effective efficiency and phase current on the, on the salient pole web width. And they also, uh, oh, one thing I didn't cover on these things, it, let's go back to this slide. If you look at, uh, <clears throat> you study this land, you see this little web here and this little piece here. <clears throat> Remember, these machines go pretty high speed, so you can't rely on adhesive to hold these together. So these are mechanical pieces of the lamination that hold this together at speed. The, about the maximum speed you can do an IPM like this is about uh, 90 meters a second. That's a tip speed. That's about the maximum you can do. If you're going to go faster than that, uh, this is going to yield too much. and uh, your air gap's going to close up, cause rubbing, things like that. So you have to use 
uh, retainment sleeves around the magnets such as 300 series stainless, Inconel, carbon fiber, Kevlar, things like that. Are you still using Kevlar? Carbon fiber. Carbon fiber, okay. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so, so, uh, so that's why they, they do this, but there's a, you pay for this. There's a penalty you pay because flux leaks through there. You see, so, so you have to optimize these to make those as thin as possible to minimize leakage, but thick enough so that uh, the, uh, the mass of the magnets and this amount of steel doesn't cause yield. Like the 2004 Prius, it, its max speed was 5,600 RPM. By the time they got to the 2010, they were up to 13,300. So they had to thicken this up a bit and they had to add this. The 2004 didn't have that web in there. The slots came together and the magnet corners touched. You see, by 2010 they had to have that. So everybody adds that now, okay? So, so that's, uh, uh, so, so they've plotted the efficiency increase or decrease as the current and the web thickness increases. And uh, this is an analysis of the thickness of the bridge and the web uh, having to do with relationship to mechanical stresses, okay? <clears throat> Magnet mass versus the, uh, the bridge. Natu naturally, there's a big emphasis on reducing the amount of magnet. Everybody's trying to minimize the mass of the magnets because you pay for those. And oh, another point that's important about these, all these IPMs, they all use rectangular flat slab magnets and they don't grind them. They're not ground. They, they, uh, they've developed techniques to, they'll take a big block of rare earth magnet material and they'll use diamond uh, impregnated wire and and if you got a block this big and you want a bunch of slices off of it you got a bunch of wires that are around rolls and and this is all wet it's wet and these things go high speed and and they'll if you look on the internet you'll see that they'll rock the magnet back and forth just a little bit with the mass of these wires on top and it just slices it goes through them the, at, at the speed I'm describing just like that those wires go through that, and you have these beautiful, accurate slabs of magnets. And they can cut them; they can cut them any which way. Okay, so so that's how they make them today. Now, if if you want arcs or shapes, they have to wire EDM them. That's much more expensive process than using flat magnets. So so these flat magnets uh, are very cheap to make because manufacturing-wise, not counting the material, because of the uh, diamond wire cutting, wet wire cutting they use. And then they uh, nickel plate them, the neodymium ones, so that they don't rust. So that's that's uh, that's a picture of the lamb from uh, uh, Oak Ridge, and and uh, so you can see up front what that thing looks like versus if you remember what the patent looked like. So you have the magnet slots, and then you have the, these other air gaps, these slits. We call those flux barriers. And the steel between them are called flux carriers. If any of you have designed any re uh, synchronous reluctance machines, that's the terminology that's used, is flux carriers and flux barriers. And uh, there again, we show the patent on that. And uh, you'll notice the holes, the hole there is not in the center of the tooth. That's just one lamb. And they varied across there, depending on which stack for the skew. And the skew, by the way, is as a V skew. It's not this kind of a skew. It's skewed like that. I think I have a picture of it somewhere here. Uh, there's six of these stacks to make a full core. And the magnets are inserted one at a time. And, uh, and I believe, I, I'm, I shouldn't say this for a fact, I think they're magnetized during the insertion process, but I'm not positive of that. So, oh, I do say that. Without confirmation, we suggest that magnets are purchased unmagnetized and magnetized right before insertion using out of, and it'd be very easy, you know, as that's coming out of the chute, it's got a station, bang, you magnetize it, and then for the next one, you reverse it, reverse the polarity, so you got a north-south, north-south. No, that way you can't make a mistake. 
And uh, you see how it's skewed? Right hand view, see how it's skewed? And uh, you can see the segments there, and those are those aluminum clamp rings on each end. Oh, each one of these stacks is 22 millimeters thick, and the magnets are roughly the same length, and slightly less. And, oh, and, and there's a good reason for not using a magnet the whole length. You know, the first Toyota Prius, in, in its length, it had two magnets. But you, you wouldn't do that anymore. Eddy currents are too high. So, so by breaking this up into six magnets, you greatly reduce the eddy currents created in, within the magnets themselves. And of course, the core is all laminated, so eddy currents are minimized in that. Now, I want you to look at that upper right-hand picture. I think that is so clever because I've, I've uh, designing these machines for many years. I never thought of this method. You, you put the magnet in the slot, and then there, there's a station in, the, in that index table where they, they uh, it's like four center punches coming from each side. And they, they bang that in, and they detent the outer lamb on each side, which pushes metal up, up into the, the gap between the magnet and the steel and forces the magnet to the outside. This is so clever. I'm sure it's patented, but... I make prototypes that way. They're not going to sue me for a prototype, but I do that myself. I just do it with a hand punch and a hammer. Works. Fine. You don't want to hit it too hard. You crack the magnet, but that's pretty easy to. That that is a great way. Uh, uh, Toyota's getting sued big time because they mold their magnets in place using a thermoplastic, and uh, boy, they're going to get. They're going to have to pay up big time for that because there's a patent with an American company. On that, but uh, so I wouldn't do that. I would advise you don't don't hold your magnets in with a thermoplastic. Use Loctite, use varnish, use epoxy, but don't use a thermoplastic or you'll get sued. Okay, and you'll lose. Uh, yeah, they, see they they have lag bolts. You, you didn't see them in that one view, but those holes you have these lag bolts that go through there that. Nut runners draw them up, and that when you in the movie you'll see the whole stack collapse together, and that's where they're. You don't see the nuts, but the nuts are holding that together. So uh, the Toyota Prius had a single layer of magnet. And you see, that's what the back EMF looks like. It's kind of sinusoidal, but not really. It's kind of crampy, but that's the most successful hybrid electric car in the world. So don't knock it, right? But it's ugly. Any of who, who owns a Prius? Oh, you own a Prius. It's a great car, but they're so ugly. I and uh, uh, my father taught me when I was 18 years old. He said, "Don't ever go out with an ugly girl, and don't ever drive an ugly car." So that's why I don't have a Prius. Nobody laughed. Hey, a fellow told me the other day. The more I learn about women, the more I love my pickup truck. Oh, you didn't like that one either. Okay. All right, here's, here's some back EMF shapes. Now, you, you saw the, the Prius. There's the Prius. And here's a comparison of the, the top is the Lexus, the Lexus with that magnet in the middle of the V. And the Chevy Volt looks like this. It's not that great either. But look at the BMW. Look at that BMW i3. That is spectacular, isn't it? I'm impressed. So let's uh, get off of that. And let's talk about the, the battery pack. That's what the battery pack looks like. I don't know if anybody's interested in that. There's 45 volt modules and you can replace any one of them. Uh, I don't really know who makes that, but you, you see what the the nominal voltage and the peak voltage is. Here's another interesting thing. Uh, Toyota, in all their cars, they, nowadays they use 200 volt battery packs. But the DC rail to the inverter is 650 volts. They're the only people who do that. They do that with a DC to DC converter. So they boost the voltage from 200 volts to 650 volts. <coughs> That's so that they don't have to do so much field weakening to get the max speed, where <coughs> everybody else got to do a lot of field weakening. 
<coughs> By the way, there's a picture of Tamagawa's. Uh, no, no, that's the. <coughs> <clears throat> That's the resolver that BMW uses. It's not supplied by Tamagawa. That's the rotor. <clears throat> Let's look at what the power converter looks like for those who are interested. Uh, that's the whole package. Sits on top of the motor. And we got some nice pictures from Oak Ridge on, on this. And what, what's amazing to me about it is the... The uh, IGBT power module, they didn't design it themselves. It's not special. It's a standard off-the-shelf Infineon product. I don't know how they, how they did that, but that's what they use. Uh, I think I got an, there's a picture of it. <coughs> there's a data sheet. <coughs> now, everybody else uses discretes and all kinds of special complicated design of which Toyota is the most complicated. <coughs> they're, they're cooling, heat sinking. The, the way Infineon does this is this module has little, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm choking because of my blood pressure medicine. When you get old, you have all kinds of these things you gotta deal with. But, uh, the, uh, what, what Toyota does is they, is they take the, the uh, emitter and the collector layer apart from the, they, they take the layers apart and, and, and put uh, cooling layers between them with liquid cooling in between them. They sandwich those up. It's amazing the complexity of how they build their, their uh, transistor bridges to cool them. Uh, they don't buy anything standard. They have everything all special made. And uh, the details you'll have to look up there on Oak Ridge. You'll see. You won't believe how they do it. But, uh, but uh, BMW, they spent their money elsewhere and used it, were able to use the standard Infineon bridge. And uh, here's a description of, the, of all for those who want to study it. Uh, you can study all these things. See where the uh, inverter mounts right to the motor. This mounts on top of the motor. You can see the different layers in inside. It's uh, cut apart there. And of course, this is liquid cooled. You see that bottom. That bottom die casting is just a. Uh, uh, I, I don't know what it looks like inside. I haven't seen it, but Oak Ridge is taken apart. But the uh, the Infineon part has has a, a base plate that the devices are mounted on and it's got a pin square pin sticking down that are cast as part of it and that goes down in this cooling uh, channel chamber this bottom cooling chamber to give a lot of surface area you know if you if you little square posts there's a whole bunch of square posts in the bottom of there uh, their uh, module that you buy and it's cooled in this puddle or this pool of liquid connectors I think that's a repeat that's a controller board uh, They've uh, even Oak Ridge has identified the part numbers and things like that for any of you who are interested in them. I'm not really interested in all those part numbers and design. I'm a physicist, a magnetician. I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't design electronics. But so uh, Oak Ridge provided all this, so I provide it to you for your information for those who are interested. Okay. So let's uh, let's let's talk about how we simulated this thing. Uh, we used a product called MotorSolve by Infolitica, and uh, the following slides are, uh, are the results of that simulation, and then finally we compare those results with some of the test results by Oak Ridge. And uh, this software product we use by Infolitica has standard templates for most types of uh, PM brushless machines, but uh, there was no template for this one, so, so what happened is, uh, Oak Ridge Labs took a lamb and they scanned them. And then they digitized that and then created a, 
uh, DXF file, and we uh, and we imported those into the software, and uh, and created a template, an actual template, very accurate of what the rotor and stator looked like. So. Uh, So th there again, let's start with the specifications of the motor. It's a PM, 250 Newton meters, 11,400 RPM, voltage range 250 to 400, max phase current 400 amps, six pole pairs, 12 poles, weight liquid cooled. Okay, so that's, so, so here's the, the model of the stator we created from the, from the scan digitized DXF file. Okay, you could see that little section there. And it created the stator you see on the right. That's a 3D picture of the actual stator we used in the model. Okay. We all we need is a DXF segment, half of a tooth. That's all we need to create the stator. Okay. <clears throat> half a stator tooth, half a stator uh, slot, and a, a piece of the the yoke. So there's the rotor. That's we did the same thing with the rotor. So you can see there's half of a rotor pole, let's call it. <clears throat> and uh, there's no dimensions here, but they're all accurate based on the scanning of an actual lamination and digitizing it. So this is the model we created in Infolitica software that shows the rotor and the stator, okay? And the reason it's shaded the way it is in the middle is because this is skewed. We can model this skewed. And we model it in that step skew, the exact same uh, six step skew that they, that they built it. That's the way we model the skew, exactly the same. So <clears throat> we have to list some parameters there, you know, the speed, the rated current, and the supply voltage, and the OD, air gap thickness, and the, the stack height, and all that information we got from Oak Ridge. And, uh, and here's the details of the stator lamb. And, uh, and we, we give you all the dimensions. Yeah, we, I didn't know we gave that. Yeah, we give all the dimensions. The tooth width, the gauge of the lamb material, slot opening, slot depth, all those things. And, <clears throat> and here's the winding details. And the winding details uh, was reverse engineered by Oak Ridge. 72 slot, nine turns per coil, and six parallel current circuits through the stator with one neutral connection for each uh, path. Coils in series per, per phase, one per leg, number of wires, and there's 12 strands of 21 gauge wire per turn, 12 strands per turn. So that's what the winding looks like. That's what that's phase A. <clears throat> okay, and, and the lower right hand corner is where all the the turns go. So uh, you'll notice it uh, up up here the winding factor. Do you see that? Wind, winding factor is a very important parameter that's used for by a motor designer. <clears throat> We, can, we could change the winding pitch. We could increase the pitch one slot, decrease it, and that'll change the winding factor. It also changes the back EMF, changes a lot of things. But uh, <clears throat> you, you'll want to keep the interns as short as possible, so we, we tend to short pitch the, the coils for a distributed winding like this, but you don't want to short pitch it too much because the winding factor goes down. What does that mean? Uh, a 12-slot four-pole motor with this three slot coil pitch has a winding factor of one. That means the front and back of each coil is exactly in the center of each pole, each magnet. That's unity, that's the best you can get. If I short pitch it, why the winding factor is less, that means that, that only 66% of those conductors are producing torque. The rest is wasted ohmic losses. So to get my voltage constant or torque constant, I may have to add a turn or two. I may have to make the wire gauge smaller to fit the, the extra turn in, you see what I mean? So that's why winding factor is, is so important. Then as part of the winding factor is the skew factor. If you skew the magnets, if you skew the flux, 
then that reduces the the distribution. You know, because these if if all the poles are in line on that 124, all the conductors are right in the center. My winding factors unity. But if I skew that, only not all of that. Uh, they're, they're not all centered anymore because it's only centered as you rotate it. So that reduces your winding factor. So these softwares calculate all that stuff. Everybody's does, I guess. So uh, so we're going to begin to look at some of the performance. Well, before we do that, uh, we, we got to pick materials. You know, in the software, you got to pick materials. Now, <clears throat> now uh, sometimes in, when we reverse engineer a motor, we don't know what the materials are, but Oak Ridge has all this equipment, so they, they can measure magnets and measure steel, and they can tell you what the, what the materials are. So w we have a big database of materials, so we, we just inputted, selected the right materials and inputted them, and uh, uh, that's what we use for simulation. So here's a, a summary of all the parameters used for the, the simulation. And, uh, and then the first thing we do is we look and see what the back EMF looks like. So there's the, the, the simulated back EMF with the skewing. And uh, this is at 4,500 RPM. And that's pretty close to what it should be. You can figure that out from the voltage constant, the volts per thousand RPM constant. That came out pretty close. Here we are at 11,400 RPM, okay? And remember, what's important about this is you see, this is a 4,500 RPM, and our DC rail voltage on this motor is, 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 uh, is like, uh, what did I say it was? I forget what it was, 300 volts or something like that. So, so this is not, uh, you have to feel weakened for this to ever go. Look, look the, the peak voltage is 510 volts at max operating speed. See? <clears throat> so all these IPMs are designed for a, uh, uh, a back EMF to be quite high so that the current, starting current, if you, if you designed it so you wouldn't have to phase advance and your starting current would be too high to get enough torque at zero speed. And inverters... And current costs money. Voltage is cheap, current's expensive. So there's the open circuit flux distribution. And there's and our, our peak, our red would be 2.1 Tesla, as you can see from the bar graph. So so the open circuit uh, flux distribution is not uh, there's the only saturation that you'll see are in these uh, little tips. Uh, the webs in, that hold the rotor together. That's the only place you'll see saturation. And the color in this picture is not very good. It really is red in some places, but it's got buried, it's so small, you don't see it with this dark green background there. You, you know what I mean by that? Everybody know what I mean by that? It, it's, well, we don't, we're, we're bound to get some saturation there's not a lot of places to saturate. You're bound to get some saturation maybe right in there, I would say, and right in here. But you don't see signs of it like you do in the Toyota motor. Maybe that's another example of this design, why it's so good, because those little webs are not saturable. I never thought about that before. But anyway, this is the plotted open circuit air gap flux. As you can see, uh, we're only getting about, this is open circuit, we're only getting a little over 0.6 uh, Tesla. It's not very high. Some of the machines are higher than that. Uh, two torque components. As I said before, one is uh, the reluctance torque and the other is the permanent magnet torque. Here's the plotted uh, difference between those two torques, the magnet torque and the reluctance torque and the sum of the two. So, so uh, you, you can, so, you, with this software, you can solve for the, the peak. The, the red line is the peak, so that read, you can read the angle. 35 degrees is what is going to give you the, 
the peak torque out of this machine. And it's good to, uh, designers use that to predict what that should be for the inverter guy so he knows where to start for commissioning. Four hundred amps. I don't know, I'm not I don't remember what all these different simulations are, why they're different. I can't I can't remember what they are. Apologize. So so let's uh this is the published uh traction uh performance specs for the motor that we saw before and uh, uh, the torque and power. So, and so what, what we did is we digitized that curve with some software, and here's all the XY data points. And, uh, and, and what, what, what is commonly done, inverter designers, you, you don't need the whole curve to define the envelope. All you need are five or six points on that curve. So, uh, so, so we, we took the, the plot furnished by the manufacturer and we digitized that data and then we picked five or six points on there, load points that we want to model and check against, uh, rather than doing the whole curve, we're going to check these points. So we picked these points, so we've got torque and power. The orange is a power and the blue line is a torque. And, uh, and so, this is where I'm telling you we digitized this. And, and the first, the, but the first thing we do before we run these with the software, you gotta run a little test on the current to make sure that, that uh, the chopping frequency is gonna converge the current within the, <clears throat> the chopping frequency you selected is gonna, is gonna chop the current and make a sine wave. All right, so, so we do that with, a, uh, with a, another little, routine to make because otherwise you'll get bad results if I didn't check this <clears throat> and what if my uh, chopping frequency was too low and so I would I would never get to the peak current okay so we checked that first and we did that uh, for some magnet or for some field weakening angle extremes and then we saw for the first load point one of these I don't know which one yeah, we solve for each one of those load points, number six, number five, number four, number three, and, and these uh, uh, come out very close to, the, uh, <clears throat> to what uh, that torque speed curve shows. And this is a, a plot of the peak torque versus current, and uh, you can see that at... Uh, up to 4,500 RPM, you see those. I, I, maybe I should have generated a comparison chart where you'd see what the, uh, we can check one. Anyway. So, uh, the other thing we do is, uh, is uh, measure the static torque of a machine. Now you can measure that and you can calculate that. And what does that mean? <clears throat> that means if you if you take a motor and mount it with a rotary table and a torque transducer, you you uh, you put a uh, you could mount the stator of a motor in a rotary table, and then connect a torque transducer to the earth, a static torque transducer, and then you put a certain amount of current line to line between two uh, terminals, DC current. And then you rotate the rotary table and you'll plot the torque versus rotor angle. <clears throat> and, and you try that at different currents and you make this plot. This is done a lot in testing of machines and of course we can plot that. The, you do this with switch reluctance machines, synchronous reluctance machines, or permanent magnet machines. You don't do this when, and you can't do this with induction motors because they have to have slip to produce torque. You can only do this with synchronous machines or permanent magnet machines. So we can plot that, compare that. Uh, this is the, uh, the simulated back EMF, line to neutral and line to line, uh, as compared to the 
the uh, measured one. It's, the measurement is not compared on this. And here's uh, Oak Ridge's comparison of the back EMF to other cars. The Prius, the Accord, the Honda, the Accord Gen, Accord, Accord generator, and the Accord traction motor in the BMW i3. I don't know why that's useful, but here's a summary <coughs> of the data. This is a summary of the data. You can see the uh, parameter, the units, BMW, Oak Ridge data, and simulated data. And you can uh, compare these. Uh, <coughs> I would say it's, they're quite favorable. We don't have measurements for everything, but uh, the uh, Maybe, maybe open circuit back EMF 478 versus 483. I think that, that tells a lot right there. And uh, the uh, peak power came out the same, rated power. So that's kind of a summary of, uh, of the BMW published data, Oak Ridge, measured data, and simulated data. Here's a, uh, some other interesting parameters to compare is the, the silicon area, the surface area of the silicon used for all these different motors. I'm not gonna go over them right now, but uh, you, can, you might find that useful. And here's a, a uh, similar summary from Oak Ridge on the copper and magnet mass for these different machines, how much copper is used and how much, uh, and as you can see, the BMW is pretty good. The, the Accord is very impressive. <clears throat> the Alexis uh, was pretty good. The original 2004 Prius wasn't so good, but, that's, but everybody came after that and copied and made their machines better, improved their designs. As, as I point out at the bottom, there's different voltage. There are different voltages, you know, the DC rail voltages are different for, for these machines. The, the BMW and the Accord and the Leaf are about the same, and all the Toyota machines are the same, but they're, they're double. They're roughly double the voltage of everybody else, including the, the volt. And then we've got some efficiency plots here that uh, these efficiency plots are very useful because in, in, in cars, they have drive cycles. They have urban drive cycle, uh, city driving cycle, and uh, congested traffic driving cycles. So, so, they, so they use these efficiency plots in, uh, along with the drive cycle, uh, standard drive cycles, to, to uh, establish uh, the mileage they're going to get on a car, you see? And uh, I, I guess the government goes along with that to some extent, I suppose. I think the car companies are a little smarter than some of the people that work for the government, but I'm not sure of that. So, uh, so what we've done is, we, this is BMW's efficiency plot. And, and look at the, just have a look at the 97% range, you know, this, this area in the middle. So the speeds and gear ratios are, are gonna be selected based on this and the typical driving cycle that a, a particular car is targeted for, you know, whether it's a commuter car or, or whatever. And uh, Motorsol, this is their efficiency plot, and, and of course it's, it's similar, it's very similar, not exactly the same. This is, uh, this is Oak Ridge's, uh, now what did Oak Ridge use? Uh, I, I don't know what BMW used for that. I know that Motorsolve uses the efficiency uh, plot algorithm from Infolitica. I don't know what Oak Ridge uses, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's ANSYS. ANSOFT ANSYS, I'm pretty sure. Because I know that's what they use, but I didn't specifically. So, well, the one thing I like about this one, it gives you numbers on the screen, you can see actual numbers, but it seems like it's got a lot of discontinuities in it, and that's problematic. To me, it is anyway. I, I, it should be smooth like these, you know? So that, that means there's some, some f maybe the finite element mesh is too coarse or something like that. But uh, they're similar. Uh, so, 
So this same motor now has to generate, it's not only a motor providing traction, it's got to generate as well. Because when you brake, you've got all this kinetic energy stored in the mass of the car. So you can't waste that because you want to put that back on the, on the battery pack. So, so, uh, so there's, there's uh, several modes of, of generating, but you don't use them all in that uh, braking energy. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the key thing about regen is that no current will flow back to the battery unless the voltage generated by the generator is higher than whatever the, back, uh, whatever the battery voltage is at that instant. And of course, uh, uh, but, but I guess electronic geniuses have ways to boost the, you know, use a DC to DC converter to boost the voltage that's coming off the generator. So, but but these, this type of uh, DC braking or braking does not give you battery charging all the way to zero speed. So you still need hydraulic brakes to stop it and all that. But, but, uh, uh, but using electronics, they're able to to uh, boost the voltage up enough even when the uh, back EMF of the generator is lower than the DC rail. But uh, so th this is a typical uh, configuration they would use. They would use an active transistorized uh, converter that would uh, so that when you go into regen, the the voltage is going back through the diodes to uh, to uh, charge the battery up. Current, as I said, current will flow when the when the battery voltage is higher, or when the uh, generator output voltage is higher than the battery voltage. And uh, th we si we could simulate a family of regulation curves with different power factors. And uh, th this is a whole family of curves. So <clears throat> if you c we can move this vertical cursor along there, and uh, and the and and you could see uh, how far down the battery is going to drop in voltage along that curve. Or you know, like uh, uh, this particular case, 600 volts is the maximum output voltage. So uh, if the battery voltage was 550. You see, you could move this along there to the 550 line and see much, see how much output power you can get out of the generator. That's what this is used for to, to uh, predict what the output power, max output power is. That's not so important with this traction motor, but it is a, for a pure generator. It's more important as you'll see in a minute. Now this is the, uh, the output voltage versus current. On the vertical axis, is, that's the short circuit current. It, or the, no, the no load, the open circuit current. The horizontal current is a short circuit current. Like if you would short the windings out, the max current that would flow through there would be this 450 amps. And, uh, but at open circuit, there's no current flowing, so the voltage, the output voltage. When you start to load, as you can see, when you start to load a generator down, as the current goes up, the voltage drops. So. The output power is, is just multiplying the, the voltage and the current. That's the output power. Uh, aircraft generators have to survive the short circuit current. So, so they have specially designed machines that, that uh, can survive that short circuit current. Uh, so here's the, the measured back EMF at 500 RPM, and it's proportional. It doesn't matter what speed, it's proportional to this. So this is A to B, A to C, and B to C. This is the back EMF. And uh, here's the phase currents and voltages used to regulate current. You can see the voltage is chopped to give you those phase currents for the, the three phases. And uh, so, I guess now I'd like to talk about the range extender. So a lot of these cars have that uh, motor scooter motor in it with a, with a generator on it. And uh, so uh, I'd like to show you what I have on that. It's uh, quite a different machine. It's, it's a 10-pole rotor instead of 12. And it's, the stator's got 15 slots 
So that means the coils are wrapped around each slot, each tooth. It's a, it's a, it's a fractional slot winding, a half a slot per pole per phase. Now, that, that configuration is patented by Pabst in Germany, half a slot per pole per phase. I don't know if they're going to sue Valio or not, but there's been a lot of lawsuits over there, and, and uh, Pabst has always won. So I don't know what's going to happen, but that's beside the point. So, uh, so, so a simple diode bridge rectifier can be used for this, and, uh, or an active bridge rectifier. So this is a picture of that Kim KYMCO 650cc two-cylinder uh, IC engine. That's what they use for a, uh, a uh, that's the other side of it. And uh, they take this, this part off right here, that, that gear thing you see, and uh, they attach this uh, range extender. That's uh, right out of the BMW service manual, manual. Manual. I couldn't find a part number for this, but I'm sure there is one. If I go into a dealer, I could find a part number for that, and I could buy that and take this apart and look at it if I wanted to. But that's the the uh, internal permanent magnet generator for the range extender. And here's a picture of it that I got from Valio, and you see the cover removed. 30 kilowatts. Somebody asked me what the rating was. I couldn't remember. 30 kilowatt, 300 volts. Okay, so <clears throat> as you can see, the it's a spoke design. Uh, those light-colored things are the magnets, and that's uh, another picture of it. I, I guess this is probably done by some 3D CAD system. I got this from Valio as well, and uh, that shows the stator and the rotor. And uh, this is an actual photograph of the rotor that was uh, last year at this show in Berlin. That was, they had that in their booth, so a friend of mine took a photograph of it and sent it to me. So that's what it looked like. It's very interesting. It's a core that's laminated, and as you can see, they're, they're dimpled together. You see those little dimple holes? That's where they nest them together. So you get this stack right off the die and then those rectangular slots are where the magnets go. These are neodymium magnets. And you'll notice that the, the shape of the, the soft iron poles are curved. And that's for sinusoidal back EMF. And this has a very nice sinusoidal back EMF. But anyway, that's what it looks like. And uh, they insert the magnets in there. And uh, the, uh, as you'll see in a minute, you've got big air holes in there. Those triangular holes are air holes. And you'll see what that does to the flux distribution. It's quite quite interesting. So, so uh, I d I don't have a lamb for this. So, so uh, uh, since no detailed information was available, we created a model based on estimates from the photographs in order to simulate the expected performance and study the flux distribution in the rotor as well as the back EMF. And Adrian Perigo from Infolitica, he, he uh, helped me build the DXF file for the CAD as he did for the traction motor. And so this is a model we came up with, okay? We have a pretty good idea what the OD of the stator was. We're pretty sure that's pretty close. So one thing I wasn't sure of was the stack length. Not sure of that, I only estimated that based on proportions from the photographs. But as you could see, the the magnets are shown as two pieces. That's, that's just to indicate to the user that the red's a North Pole and the blue's a South Pole. But that's just one magnet in there. It's just magnetized straight through. So, so you have two North facing the soft iron and two South facing the soft, another soft iron. So, so that's, uh, that's what the whole configuration looks like. And uh, I tried all kinds of different number of... Uh, turns and parallel paths and all that to, to come up with something that looks reasonable for what the performance has to be to be able to charge these batteries. So I came up with five parallel paths, five neutrals, 26 turns per coil. You see, you really, if you start with one turn per coil, if you go to two turns, you've doubled the back EMF. You go to three turns, you tripled it. So you have to go with parallel paths. And if I double the parallel paths, 
I double the turns. If I triple the parallel paths, I triple the turns. So, so that allows me to use a lot, as many parallel paths as I can and then, and then adjust the number of turns by one turn and I can get some nice resolution on the back EMF. I can refine, that's a trick that designers know how to do. That's what, the, this is where we select the material. I assumed the material to be 35 uh, uh, grade neo, high temperature neo and silicon steel. And uh, uh, so, so slabs, slice slabs and magnet, stamp pockets to minimize flux leakage. You see those big pockets and to focus the, the flux, as you'll see, it focuses very nicely. And laminated poles shaped to minimize carving and improve the back EMF wave shape. Look at that open circuit flux tissue, and that is beautiful, isn't it? So 1.6, almost 1.7 Tesla in the gap, open circuit, you get with a, a Neil slab magnet like that. There's no other way to get that kind of flux density other than with a spoked type construction, okay? That's very impressive. You won't see any motors over 1, 1.05, maybe, maybe you'll find one at 1.1 Tesla in the average flux density in the air gap, but I've never seen one at 1.1 Tesla. So 1.69 is very impressive. Okay? Pretty cool, huh? And here's where we did our, uh, our uh, voltage regulation curve to, to uh, determine what the max output of this machine could be. It depends where you put the, uh, what, what uh, the uh, power factor is. But, and, and this is the uh, open circuit voltage on the, on the vertical axis and locked rotor current on the horizontal. And that's what the back EMF looks like. Now that's, it's pretty sinusoidal. It's got a lot of harmonics in it, but it's not bad. It's all three phases where the other one I showed you is only one phase. That's not bad. That's okay for a generator. That's okay. Plug in or find another power source. Really? Reserve battery. I don't know. Are we, are we got power on this thing? It's giving me a power source error. Did I kick something and unplugged it? I might have kicked it. It's okay. Oh, I just hit okay. Okay. We don't worry about it. I'm almost done. So uh, here's output power versus load impedance uh, at uh, different resistance and speed. Uh, here's this kind of a summary of the uh, range extender generator, uh, 30 kilowatts, 95% efficiency. Peak line to line voltage, 350 volts. Peak line current, 107. Current density is very reasonable. <coughs> very reasonable. We could go up to 3,500 on that without serious cooling. <coughs> and I don't know if air gap stress means anything to you, but remember I said, here's the rotor, here's the stator. If I take the torque and divide it by the radius, I get a tangential force in the air gap. If I divide that by pi d l, that's the swept area. That's a beautiful measure of how hard I'm working the machine. The motor in your air conditioner or your refrigerator in your house is about one PSI. Power plant machines are 20 PSI. Aircraft liquid cool machines are 15. You know, servo motors, intermittent duty, 10. You see, that gives you an idea of how hard, and, and uh, this relates to torque density, but it all relates to how you cool in this machine. The better you cool it, the more you, re well, first of all, build an efficient machine with low iron losses and copper losses, but then you're stuck with the losses you got in this given frame. Now get rid of the heat, so you can improve that air grab stress value.
here's a summary of all the other data, the mass, the dimensions, and all that stuff. And I guess I'm done. Thanks for attending. I hope it was interesting, and I take a few questions. By by the way, uh, here's some good uh, books on machine design. If any of you are interested, in induction machines, a great book, lower left hand corner, by by uh, Dr. Tom Lippo, retired. Uh, motor engineer from, motor professor from, uh, from WEMPEC from University of Wisconsin. And uh, uh, these upper right-hand books are two books that Tim, Professor Tim Miller and I wrote. The, the middle one, the top one there, is, uh, was published by uh, Oxford Press. They sold 5,000 copies of that. That's the, that's the Bible for PM machines. And, uh, but they made all the money, so Tim and I updated it 16 years later. That's the green book on the right. But this book at the bottom, Rotating Electrical Machines, it's by a, a, a woman professor from Czechoslovak Czech Republic and two uh, professors from Norway or Finland someplace. And it's a very good textbook on PM machines. It covers a lot of, of uh, topics that Tim Miller and I didn't cover. And then Ned Mohan from University of Minnesota that's an excellent book on, on uh, electric machines of all type. So, anybody have any questions? Um, so, a cogging torque, for instance, cogging torque, and anything which can damage bearing, for instance, in one of you know, any of the applications? Um, well, those are two subjects. Cogging torque, in most applications, cogging torque doesn't matter. You go to a show like this, and people got motors on the table, and they go up and they finish that, oh, that's a lousy motor. Yes. Um, actually, I'm more concerned about the radial forces because radial forces because of the cogging torque. Radial forces. Yes. One of the applications I was working on was, uh, the, you know, my bearing was uh, getting damaged in one direction, and um, I'm trying to figure out whether it's a cogging torque, torque ripple, or some other impact. No, it's uh, just a brushless DC motor. Uh. I, I, I wouldn't say the cogging torque had anything to do with that, but cogging torque is easy to get rid of by, by skewing the rotor or skewing the stator. That's the easiest way to get rid of cogging torque. Okay, anything which uh, we can do to reduce the radial forces? The what forces? The radial force um, on, on, the, on the rotor. Uh, it's the, the rotors in levitation. It's uh, maybe maybe your rotors ex the OD of the rotors is, is it eccentric to the stator. Yes, it is. Oh, well, make it the the answer to that is make it concentric. Sorry, I don't mean to be glib, but the, I, I would say the only reason you could have a change in radial forces if your rotor is not. Uh, in the equilibrium, if you got a different air gap on one side than the other, is that rotates that you got a vertical uh, torque moment or a force moment that's going to be a function of speed. But if your OD in, uh, of the rotor and ID of the stator is concentric, I don't think you. Uh, it's not. Have you ever heard of this? It's not intentionally done, uh, but uh, just because of the manufacturing tolerancing, uh, we see some difference, How, or we see some eccentricity. How? Uh, is this a tiny little motor? Yes, it is very, very tiny. Oh, it's a 50, 60 watts motor. 50, 60 watt motor. What, what eccentricity do you expect you have? Um, ten thousandths. Oh my gosh. That's an awful lot on that small of a motor. 
Do you have ball bearings or sleeve bearings? No, it's a, it's a plastic uh, PPS material bearings. It's what? PPS. Never, never use sleeve bearings on a permanent magnet motor. Always use ball bearings. They're so cheap. I'd change the bearings. That's what I would do. Okay. All right. Thank you. So you can hold it better. Ten thousands is really sloppy. I can see why you'd have. And, and, and the answer to your question is use ball bearings. Or better sleeve bearings that, you know, are more concentric. I mean, that's, that sounds like a glib answer, but it's really all you can do. There's no magic solution. Anything else? Okay. Uh, I have one, uh, one last question. Uh, now, if I look into the back EMF profile, I see some fluctuations in the peak, um, you know, profile. Um, and I, I actually... It's probably, I, well, I guess it's that eccentricity. How many slots do you have? How many poles and slots? It's a, it's a 12 uh, tooth stator with 14 pole neodymium rotor. 12-4. Well, probably that air gap is that variable air gap as it rotates is giving you. Is that a is that a once per rev? Um, I didn't get that question. What what do you mean by that? Once per revolution. Uh, is the variation once per rev? You might no, check no, no, that. No, 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 no. Well, I I have to check that. I'm not sure about that. Well, if it's the if it's the air if it's a ten thousand variation in the air gap, that would give you a once per rev. Uh, fluctuation in the back EMF, I would okay. think. All right, thank you. If it's more than once per rev, I, I don't know what that would be. Is it three phase? Well, how have you, you, you should, when you're looking at the back EMF, all three phases, check and see if there's any displacement. You should be 120 electrical degrees between look at the zero crossings and compare that very accurately on a scope. That'd be interesting to see. Okay. Anything else? Thank you very much.